Yes, you're very welcome along to the Huddle Breakdown. After a short period away, Alan Morrison, Celtic by Numbers, is back with us on the podcast, as is Jiko James. And we are just about a week and a half, just two weeks away from the start of the new season. It feels like it has both been a very long time and a very short time, given how much has happened over the last couple of weeks. It doesn't feel like we've actually had an off season at all, but we're nearly back for the season. There is a game tomorrow, Celtic take on Wolves in Dublin, and then it is James Forrest's uh, testimonial match next week against Athletic Club, so hopefully he gets a good turnout for that. We're going to be looking at the preseason as a whole on the podcast today, and we're also going to be looking at some of Celtic's new signings that have been confirmed since we last recorded a podcast. So, guys, how are you? Good to see you again. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm recovering from heat stroke, as you might be able to tell by looking at me, but... Uh... You know, my, mine's not because of lounging um, at, uh, you know, eight star hotels like um, you guys have been doing the last week. So uh, mine, mine's from hard work. Well, you can see Alan doesn't have a red tinge. He more has a, a lovely tan from sitting by the pool over the last couple of weeks. Feet up. No, no, I've been uh, actually walking around Paris mostly, uh, just, you know, dodging the showers, to be fair. It's been much the same weather as it has been in Sheffield, which is, you know, rain, sun, wind, uh, cloudy, repeat for the last few weeks. So, uh, but no, it was lovely, you know, sipping, sipping beer in the cafes. Apparently... Can't go wrong. So Celtic 6-4 Yokohama FC. 1-0 win over Gamba Osaka, playing Wolves tomorrow and then Athletic Club next week for James Forrest's testimonial. Alan, I presume that, like everybody, you're outraged by Celtic's performances in these preseason and you're judging the entire season already. <laughs> yes. it's, I, I'm with you, actually. It, it, I don't know. I can't... It feels simultaneously, like you say, it feels like nothing's happening, everything's happening all at the same time. It's really weird. I can't quite get my arms around you know, I, I, I'm definitely not in any sort of panicky or overly worried mode. I think the club is going about its business. I think that's part of the thing. It's actually been really quiet in many respects. And you almost feel like nothing's happened. But actually, we have played a number of pre-season friendlies. We have signed a lot of players. There is a lot going on. But it's I think it's all just happening at a fairly calm, sort of business-like basis. Um, and probably not the headlines being generated that others would wish to see. So... I think that you know, we, you know, I'm probably filling the blanks and the gaps with my own sort of uh, insecurities, I suppose. But, but much as much as a lot of fans kind of kind of do, you know, it does feel like we've hardly played any games, and yet if you count this two sort of um, Porto Menense games behind those doors, we've played seven preseason games by the time we kick off, which is kind of normal, really. Um, so, and you know, as you say, been around the world, been to Japan played a Premier League side and got a good test again on Tuesday. So there's plenty in there for that. But it just feels somehow like, oh, my God, are we starting already? <laughs> you know? mm. So, yeah, I agree. I'm with you. I'm with you. It's, just, it's a bit weird. I think it's James because I probably I haven't watched any of the games live because of the way they've been broadcast. And I just haven't got a grip around that Brendan Rodgers is going to be the Celtic manager next season, other than the fact that I'm looking at Ange Postacoglu in a press conference every couple of days for Tottenham Hotspur. Like, I, I don't know. I feel wholly unprepared for the season. I don't really know what to expect. And probably in a good way, I would I would say. I, we put up a poll on the Huddle Breakdown Twitter page asking how people are feeling ahead of the season. The majority of people are, are actually feeling uh, that the season is going to be quite tight. Um, I don't know if they're basing that off the way the Celtic are playing or just how close the gap um, seemed to be last season. But some a lot of people also said that they're nervous but excited. So I think that's where I would put myself. I'm not so much nervous, a little bit excited, but also just I just don't know what to expect. There is an uncertainty ahead of the season. Yeah, I think nervous excitement is probably where I would come down. Um, we're in this we are in this weird stage because you know there's obviously been a tremendous amount of change, not only because of the manager turnover, obviously, but there's been a lot of signings. Um, in and out, obviously the big one out, but we haven't really gotten to see much of it. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, it's all kind of conceptual at this point, <laughs> um, whether it's, you know, Tilio being injured and then, um, you know, the guys from, from Korea just haven't 
ramped up yet. And that's just a matter of logistics. You know what I mean? It's just timeline. So we've got all of this kind of exciting new stuff to, to, to check out and enjoy. Um, but it's all still kind of abstract. <laughs> so I think there's some anticipation with, um, with the incomings and, you know, it was nice to see home a little bit in Japan. Um, but again, snippets and some of these guys are pretty young and, you know, they have to adjust and, you know, all these things that we talk about. So there's a, there, there, there is quite a bit, it, it's obviously nowhere near, uh, it, to the degree of severity or, um, you know, uh, uh, significance broadness as when Ange took over, but I'd say it's that light. <laughs> um, and, you know, kind of deferred I me. Mean, there had been, by this point, we had had a couple of more guys kind of signed already starting um, and playing out of that group. And it, that was out of sheer necessity, right? So I don't think um, some of what we've had to do here was out of necessity. It was more methodical and well thought out um, and pipelined for, for a time. So, um, yeah, and I, it, it makes sense, I think, too, that it, if, if there are going to be some other big signings occurring that there would have to be some kind of reformulation with Rogers coming in. I mean, the idea mm -hmm. that they're going to, you know, go for that next tier or two tiers up, you know, the Jota level and maybe a tier higher to an Edward level as far as financial commitment and to do it based off of the exact blueprint that was there to do, go under with Ange here, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if that got tweaked a little and that's going to take some time too. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all very exciting. Um, and th the other part of all of this, and again, this, this gets back to the less um, uh, uh, popular part of this, which is, you know, it's it, when you have a two team league, you've got to analyze and doing what we do. You got to analyze the other team. Um, and they've made a lot of changes too. So there's a lot there to check out. There's a lot to kind of figure, try to figure out and assess um, what the competitive dynamics will be. So that that's also part of the equation. Mm. I think that's a great point that you make about the signings coming in as a necessity under Ange in the second season. I think there was very much an anticipation of the evolution of the team and the key weaknesses were already known to most people and they were looking to see who's going to be coming in and when those signings came in, it was immediately slotted into the positions to see how they get on. Whereas this season, like outside of Jota losing his position, and I said a, a few squad players to replace the already starting players who are already in the starting 11, the players who are coming into the team, it would seem are there to bolster it rather than completely replace or overhaul what is already there as a blueprint. So maybe that's why there isn't as much, I guess, fanfare around the signings as there were over previous signings last summer and in January as well. But we'll we'll kick off into the signings that have come in since we last recorded a show. So we signed a centre-back, uh, Mike Navrosky, who signs from Legia Warsaw. Uh, apparently, Josep Juranovic had a key role to play in that uh, in that developing transfer for Celtic. And then they've signed winger uh, Yang Hyun Jun, who comes in from the K-League. He was the K-League player of the season last year. And then there is... Juan Yuk Un, who comes in as a midfielder. So there's three signings, you know, bolstering positions that Celtic needed to bolster, but we'll start with the defender, Mike Navrosky, because he comes in on a fee that's reportedly around £4.5 million. That's a lot of money, Alan, and Celtic don't spend that amount of money unless he's going to come in as somebody who's going to be a starter. So is that going to be the end of Kyle Starfelt as a starting player for Celtic or is that potentially Celtic ending their 4-4 four, four, or 4-3-3 four, three, three formation and potentially shifting to a more 3-5-2 uh, formation with wing backs? Yeah, I think it's a bit early to sedate that will be the default. I suspect the default will be a back four with some configuration in front of that. So I'd be astonished if we immediately went to a back three. Um, you know, so Navrosky is coming as on, and this is a similar level of signing to what Starfelt was. Starfelt was around four and a half million. He was a Swedish international, 26 years old. Um, and also Kyogo. Kyogo was obviously very well known to, and he'd been a, he'd been a star in Japan, the Japanese league for at least a couple of seasons. So in both respects, it was a lot of money as this is, but out of all the players that we've signed, in the summer, I would expect Navrosky to be the least risky, in the sense that he's European-based. He's, you know, known in Germany, known in Poland, 
bubbling under on the fringes of just about to break into the Polish national team. So this is someone that I imagine is very well known and, and of, of, of whom there is a lot of information, both um, in terms of performance data, video, but also um, people that know the guy. What's he like? What's his temperament like? What's his personality like, etc. I think some of the, just to sort of cut back a little bit into why is there a little bit of unease or a little bit of nervousness, it's that clearly the club have been busy and I don't disagree with the signings that have been made in terms of the coherence to a player trading model. It's the fact that if you'd said to me, even before Ange left, what are the issues to be addressed, right? And I'd have said goalkeeper, left side of defence, central midfield, need to get rid of about 13 players, 10 to 13 players that need pushed out the door. And we need to think about how we are more comfortable with our homegrown ratio of players. That those are the five to do's that would be on top of my list. As I sit here today, I don't see any of those things that have been resolved. That's that's the concern. Now, Navrovsky might be the, might be part of how do we strengthen the left side of the defence. I don't know if he's better than Starfelt or not. He's certainly younger. Um, he may have a higher ceiling. I think as we've said with Starfelt, uh, although he did absolutely improve last season, he's kind of typical of the solid centre halves that we've had in the past. Yeah, rather than being that more sort of Van Dyke, Carter Vickers, Julian type level, and if we want to be more, you know, Champions League uh, proficient, we need to be getting more to that higher level. I think will he take us there? I don't know. That's to be seen. But he's the only one that I think potentially threatens the first eleven, uh, and, and therefore all these other problems that I talked about that were worrying me. I think that's part of my unease. I'm not saying that they're not being thought about. I'm not saying that people are not on it. I'm just saying I don't see the evidence of it yet. Therefore, mm. I will have the I reserve the right to be continue to worry about it, even if nobody else is. I think that I think that's well, where I'm coming from on that one. Yeah, L- last time we recorded a podcast late on into the show, Anthony Joseph tweeted about Livakovic, who is the Croatian goalkeeper who was linked with Celtic, and then about 20 minutes after the podcast had gone live, it looked like he was signing for Fenerbahce. Now there is developing bits in that story that Celtic are apparently still trying to hijack that deal, that they're still going after it. Now, how true or otherwise that is, whether that's agents at work looking to get him a better deal with Fenerbahce, who knows at this point in time, but it does look like Celtic are on the lookout for a goalkeeper, um, which matches up sort of where we thought Brennan Rodgers was thinking uh, after the press conference that I was a part of a couple of weeks ago. But uh, James, outside of what this means for Starfelt and if you want to talk about Starfield, please do. But oh, what, no, what does I don't this? Want to do that. No, okay. What does this mean about? Uh, what what does this mean for Yuki Kobayashi and his role within Celtic and his future at Celtic? Because he he really did he didn't make an imprint on the team at all. I presume that was acclimatization. Potentially, the move to Glasgow was more difficult. You know, physicality wise, he didn't look like he was quite there yet for the SPFL. But this would worry me about his future for Celtic. This seems to be someone who is, if not pushing Starfeld out of the team, is definitely going to be the number one choice to be the the first choice sub for a centre-back. Yeah, so I, I go through this dopey uh, benchmarking exercise when we, we sign new players. Um, and generally, it's been been pretty effective in, in um, kind of creating a profile of, as far as strengths and weaknesses of, of what kind of player we might be getting. Uh, with with a notable exception of Abada, when and I'll get into that probably later when we talk about him, but because I just wrote wrote about that this week to update it. But um, so you know, Starfelt's profile, Kobayashi's profile, and um, Nowaki's profile are all kind of different in in flawed in different ways, right? So Kobayashi's issue was um, the question he 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 wasn't good enough. Uh, or didn't have, again, this is all evidence, by the way, you know, so these, this is all probabilistic, right? So when I say profile, it's trying to assess some kind of probability distribution of what their skill set might be relative to strengths and weaknesses, um, knowing that it's not perfect or without its flaws. Um, so Kobayashi's was, eh, he doesn't look like he's quite good enough on the ball to be called a ball playing center back. You know, he's functional, but he may not be like really, really good at it. And there's questions about his physicality, to your point, and uh, how's he going to be able to play that position in Scotland for Celtic and what he'd scale to the European level. Um, I don't think we've seen much that 
contradicts those questions, meaning that I don't think he's answered most of that. I think those questions still exist. Um, is it possible he could develop? I mean, who knows? Maybe it's it's not a bet I would make. <laughs> um, and this kind of signing probably, you know, might suggest that that's might be the assessment that the club have as well, is my guess. Um, Starfelt was uh, interesting because I, I, I remember uh, I'm going off memory on this. I think what I wrote is that he's a tackling animal uh, with his data profile from Russia. Uh, and I think he was in Sweden before that. Uh, meaning that kind of, you know, on the ground duels, he's he's very, you know, kind of good at, at and aggressive. And I think we've seen that, meaning that he's very fast for a center back, um, but he's had some flaws in the air and he's not great on the ball. Again, most of that was was um, evident in in his profile. Um, Nwaki, I the best way I could come up with Nwaki so far is I've been trying to conceptualize it as I think he's somewhere in between Eric Sviatchenko Shvi- and Christopher Iyer. That's kind of where I've, I've put his profile, I meaning that he's got some of that athleticism and mobility of Iyer. I don't think he's at that level of speed and size for sure, but he's he, he can carry the ball. He is athletic. Um, he's got a little bit of ball playing like Sviatchenko, <clears throat> but he's not very good in the air. Um, Hmm. so this new stats bomb, or at least he hasn't been, um, defensively. So, you know, he, he, he seems like he can attack a corner pretty good, uh, which would be the opposite of, uh, Christopher Iyer. But, um, they, they have this new metric called hops, which is like a, uh, um, it's, it's inspired kind of like off of chess scoring of the strengths of players, meaning that raw aerial duel data doesn't account for who you won the duel against. So this Mm -hmm. actually, you know. We mentioned it before. If you win a duel against, um, you know, uh, Shane Duffy, that's different than if you beat Greg Taylor in a duel, an aerial duel, right? So his score basically comes in right around Sviachenko and Stephen Welsh. So that gives you an idea of where his aerial um, proficiency might be. Um, right now, again, he's young. He's 22. I think he'll be 23 early um, next year, calendar year. Uh, so, I, you know, what is that profile? It sounds like a pretty good profile. Like, you know, Sviachenko and, and um, Iyer were both good players in their own way. Uh, inevitably, with Celtic playing in Europe, center backs get blamed, <laughs> just like keepers in, to a degree, unless they're, you know, Fraser Forster or, so, or, or Boric. So, um, you know, is, is he up a level that's going to be a game changer in Europe? I hope so. Like that's, I think that's where development and a coach like Rogers and his, his age. Um, so I think he pros profiles as a good player right now. And hopefully with room to improve into, you know, what we really need, which is being able to grow into that kind of proficiency in Europe. Mm. One thing I wanted to mention when I was chatting, bringing up uh, Yoki Kobayashi is the video that Tifo football put out recently and it's basically co- looking at uh, why Premier League transfers fail and it is focused on Premier League but you could take the same logic to any league in the world really and it was data analysis from the person who assessed risk at Liverpool FC for transfers and tried to figure out whether a transfer was w- working or why it wasn't working and things like that and he came up with six different variations of why a transfer didn't work out so they are as follows players not as good as they thought a player doesn't fit the style player uh, was played out of position when he came in and the manager doesn't like the player fitness slash personal issues so that would be you know injuries or just not actually fitting into uh, the team uh, or not fitting into the city difficult move and then a current player is better so the likes of you could take that logic and apply it to Greg Taylor. The fact that we thought uh, he was going to be put out of position and then he improved immensely and he was the starting player. So he basically whistled it down to all that and came up with a probability for transfers working. And what he came out with was that even if the player has fulfilled all six of those 90%, they are, you know, filling out the 90% or on otherwise the transfers still only have a 58% chance probability chance of actually working out. So even if all those go pretty much as good as you can hope for them to go, 
you have about a 50 50 chance almost of a coin toss whether or not a transfer is going to work out so that brings me to Celtics transfer activity over the last couple of years because if you look at Celtics transfer activity over the last couple of years especially under Ange they probably do have about a 50 percent strike rate which I just thought was quite interesting and maybe that is just one of the things that you're going to have to accept with what markets were operating in at the minute that was a lot of yeah I mean, a lot right? of the things no, it's good, and I'd like to dive into that more. But a lot of the things you listed there can be mitigated to an extent with with more information. Now, you know, you don't want to risk sort of analysis paralysis and so forth. But surely, this isn't, and this is this isn't about just going, you know, oh, here's a bunch of data on uh, he's going to be good at this, and and the benchmark is this, and therefore he's, it's going to work, right? That, that I think that gets you probably a list. That kind of analysis gets you an initial starting list. Then you'd want to do sort of in-depth video assessment of, okay, so it's a wide player and he's playing in a this system or that system. He's got a, a fullback behind him or he's not got a fullback behind him. He's got he's supporting a striker or two strikers or no strikers or whatever. How does that fit our system? That's a an analyst's job. And then you've got the sort of psychometrics of, you know, what kind of person is this? And then you've got the, you know, talking to people. What kind of guy is this? What's he like? You know, how does he react to pressure? How does he has he ever been to a new city before, a new country before? Has he got a record of fitting into new environments, into different cultures, even? Um, all of that stuff, right? To me, is basic information gathering, uh, and and should be, if you're going to invest millions of pounds in a, in a in a in an employee, then why wouldn't you do all that? Why wouldn't you spend a good degree of your budget? putting into place protocol systems, arrangements with recruiting professionals to undertake that level of analysis for you in their expert field, why wouldn't you do that, right? And de-risk a lot of the factors that, that you've just described there. Because none of these things are insurmountable in terms of reducing risk when it comes to recruiting, for example, senior people in, in corporations, right? It's exactly the sort of degree of information that you would you go through it would be a, a multi-month process in many cases in whittling down people you might see them many times in terms of many interviews many different scenarios many one-to-ones with different key stakeholders to see does this person fit with the culture of the organization now i know these are different scenarios and you have to be more agile with football but i'm trying i'm laboring this because none of this is innovation right all of this is standard recruitment practices if you look at business and industry. Therefore, why doesn't football be more like that in terms of going into that sort of depth? So it absolutely astonishes me that someone has to come up with that model that you've just described, which is, to me, you know, as, as, as James would say, it's apple pie and whatever ice cream or whatever the American <laughs> thing is. Other hood and right. apple, apple custard or whatever. Right? It's just common fucking sense, right? Really, at the end of the day. So be better at it. Do it more. And and and, may, and maybe that's what Celtic are doing with these players that they are signing. Hopefully that hopefully they they are. You know the the fact that at least two of two of the signings that Celtic have made have talked about Celtic being them being aware of Celtic's interest for at least one or two years. That that suggests that there's a degree of information gathering, not just about watching videos and gathering data about performance, but actually what are they like as people? How are they going to fit in? What are they like when when the, when their team goes two 0 down? Do they pay better or worse? That kind of analysis is what you need to be doing. And just basic things like, have they ever lived away from home before? You know, have they ever left the country? How are they going to cope? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that is the one downside I see from shopping in the markets that we're in at the minute is that it is such a culture shift to go from Japan and Korea to Glasgow. It's such a different thing. The language is completely different. The culture is completely different. So, that is that is something that you do have to take into account for these players who are coming over and why they don't work out sometimes and or even or why it's a slow start. Sometimes even just getting a house, most players live in a hotel for the first couple of months while they're while they're in the country. So, I mean, it is difficult, James. It's not as straightforward as Celtic are linked with this player, therefore they get this player and that player automatically makes the team better. Yeah, so the, I, the way I would think of, or I do think about this is... Um you know, marginal advantages. And, you know, Alan's talked about this relative to on the pitch where, you know, that half of a percent, as you, as you go up the competitive landscape, you know, the finer and finer the margins get as far as, 
you know, the difference between, a, you know, a, an excellent player at, uh, you know, Sevilla versus an excellent player at Real Madrid, right? I mean, they're all really good freaking players. It's a question just a little bit different and, and a little bit better. And so I, the, the way I see it is there's um, incremental improvements that can be made. And then there's a lot of just basic stuff that doesn't get done in the football industry. Meaning that the level of analytics that I see is not very sophisticated. Uh, and some of that's cultural, meaning that, you know, there, there's been a slow adoption to buy into some of the stuff institutionally from uh, management level to when I mean, like board management level, CEO level. And then you have the probably the bigger issue, which is the bottoms up uh, bro culture of, uh, you know, the old school player um, becoming manager and, um you know, that, that, that model. And again, this all one has occurred through the other sports that have, you know, modernized, so to speak, from an analytics perspective. And I've said this over and over again, this is <laughs> that this isn't all, you know, uh, uh, apple pie and, and, and ice cream, as Alan just said, it, there, there's some downsides uh, to all of this too, from a fan perspective. But um, I mean, if you look at guys like uh, Bloom and Benham at, um, at uh, Brighton and, and Brentford, these are advanced, sophisticated analytics people. So they've been able to create cultures around that in order to um, and, and do the stuff that Alan's talking about on top of that psychometrics and personality profiles. So that's what the best of breed is doing from an analytics perspective, using machine learning, right? There's a lot of stuff going on here. And, you know, looking at, um, you know, looking at how sophisticated you can get relative to benchmarking, relative to attribution modeling, um, relative to risk modeling. These are all things that, you know, again, you can get really sophisticated into doing. Um, and I've had exposure to in my professional life for, you know, 25 years. So I have some experience in looking at this stuff and, you know, just a lot of what I see in the football space is, you know, not terribly sophisticated. Let's just put it that way. Um, so when you're doing, you know, as Alan said, it's not only information, it's what you do with the information, it's the quality of the data, and then it's also the quality of the analytics, not only the models, but the people that are using the models to be able to extract information from the noise, because that's, that's the inherent problem. You see that on Wall Street, you see that with the, uh, the, the Bank of England that just hired Ben Bernanke to help them with economic forecasting. I can tell them that's not going to work out real well. Uh, so, you know, um, th there's a whole different world here as far, and I've said this over and over again about the domain of analytics that is, is a whole different world to quote unquote data. And, and I think that the way to get from 58% up to, you know, whatever Brighton's at 70% or, you know, you're never going to get perfect. It's, it's because we're dealing with human beings here uh, and you don't know when someone's grandmother's going to die and send them into a spiral of emotional trauma. You know what I mean? Like, we all mm -hmm. live in our the, reality and, and things change. Um, so there, there's, you know, it, it's all about getting that marginal benefit up above your competition. Um, and, you know, I think Celtics made some improvement there, but my guess is they probably still have quite a ways to go. And again, best of breed, you look at what the Akmars are doing, the Salzburgs are doing above and beyond just, you know, the markets that they've uh, developed. But the IP that they have relative to analytics on, you know, things like Alkmaar doing psychometric profiling and have been for years, right? That's just, you know, that's difficult to catch up to. You've really got to commit to it and invest in it. Um, not only resources financially, but human capital of people that can actually do it. Um, yeah. Are we at the point now where we're going to have people saying, I never saw AI stick the ball in the back of the net? Is that where we're at now? Oh, Is it? Probably. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. We'll move on from that because I think there is some interesting talking points on the pitch that we can actually uh, discuss. One thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about is something you've been writing about, Alan, but it's also something that has been cropping up across some of the more interesting teams in the English league and some managers who are doing very exciting stuff. And one thing that has popped up is uh, Brighton at preseason um Liam Thorne from the or Liam Tharm, sorry, from the Athletic has been looking at their their style of play and 
their ability to go long and their choice to go long. And it seems like football is shifting a little bit from the, you know, hardcore possession based thing to if everybody's pushing up high on us, then there's definitely space in behind that. Therefore we can kick the ball long and we're suddenly back in the 1990s where long ball is king and potentially could be something that Celtic look to exploit too. You're on mute, sorry, Alan. When I was looking at long balls, you've got to place it in its correct context. So this is in the context of, are, are Celtic going to be a more flexible team under Rodgers? Are we going to be less you know, adhering to a very successful system and mode of playing and perhaps be more adaptive to, to what's happening on the, on the pitch, which is, to be fair, not something we saw a great deal of under Postecoglou, but something which I think we learned that Rodgers certainly... Uh, uh, um, Develop more tools for his toolbox, let's call it, in his time at Leicester. So, looking at one facet of play in relation to that context, not saying that, oh, there's a trend for teams going more direct or, you know, we should play more long balls for the sake of it, etc. It wasn't that wasn't the, the kind of underlying context I was thinking of. And really just looking at the squad, so to say, well, to get players who are proven at being able to play um, longer passes. And again, you know, I think I remember was it was it Bob Paisley was the quote about you know there's there isn't there aren't long passes and and, and short passes there's just you know good decisions and bad decisions and that, and that really really is what it is you can make a good decision and then you can execute well or you can execute badly so it's it's a really combination of those things and playing a playing a, a pass that's that's over a longer distance can sometimes be absolutely the right decision and again I was thinking in terms of how do we how do we how do we develop as a team. When it looks like that, what Rogers has done almost straight away is cottoned onto the fact that Maeda should be used as a centre forward, and as opposed to trying to retrain him as a winger, which is what Postecoglou tried to do, with I think sort of mixed results, if I'm being honest. And then you've got Kyogo, who is you know an elite level striker, and how do you better utilise their abilities to get in behind defences? And we saw a little bit of that in Japan, where you know. Ability to press high, but also break quickly, get the ball to these players more um, directly. Is something which why wouldn't you use that as a weapon? So that's really what I was trying to to come at it from. Um, and I think you know, in summary, I don't think we've got the centre backs to play that kind of game particularly well. I think the full backs are more are, are more sort of uh, adept, especially Alistair Johnson uh, is, is actually very good with his, his, his capability of finding players from distance. Um, I think he's, he's, he's physically strong. He can li like literally kick the ball <laughs> along the way, a long way, but I think he's something, he's a, he's a, he's something which he has proven that he can do. His packing stats, for example, are, are, are one of the best in the club in terms of that longer passing. Uh, if you look at the centre-backs, as I say, it's a bit more variable. I mean, in terms of who was best at this, you know, I do lament... The, the short Celtic career of Philip Benkovic, uh, one of the aspects of his game that he also excelled in uh, was his long passing, which was which was excellent. Chris Julien was another who was who was underrated, I think, and not quite appreciated for the the, the diversity of his passing. I always think it's another, but I think if the current crop, I don't think there's anyone really that compares. Uh, too well uh, compared to those guys in terms of the longer passing, and also in midfield. Um, you know, um, both Matt O'Reilly and David Turnbull in particular um, don't really attempt any longer passes and they're not particularly accurate when they do. Unfortunately, you know, the, probably the best proponent of a mixed array of passing that we had was Aaron Moy. Um, I'm firmly of the belief that, you know, Aaron Moy is going to be a big loss to Celtic this season in terms of what he brought to that midfield for a variety of reasons. Another reason was just the variety of his passing, his ability to go long and short uh, equally accurately. Uh, so in summary, I think it's an area that we might be looking at in terms of, and it's interesting that, um, you know, James, in relation to Narofsky that mentioned, again, perhaps he, that's something that he, he, he might bring, um, because I think it's something that we, we might be looking to see a little bit more of just under the under the auspices of being a a bit less predictable and be utilizing the strikers that we have uh, in terms of hitting wow. them early where possible. Can I ask a probably stupid question that you might have answered already in the piece, but 
how does the accuracy of the data, how does it account for long balls over the top that are into space as opposed to going to a player directly? Does it still count if the player gets the ball that it's counted as a accurate? Yeah, absolutely. I believe so. It's stats bomb data I'm referring to. So it's it's accuracy is measured by completed passes. So yeah, okay. so therefore whether you whether it's into space and then someone collects it, as long as it ends up um directly I mean, if it, if, it, if it's a long ball which a defender gets ahead on and then it goes to one of your players, that's an incomplete pass that's been intercepted and the interception uh, then results in you gaining possession. That's a recovery. <laughs> Break this down if you want. I could go on for hours about this stuff. No, but the, no it's okay. But the accuracy is purely completed passes. Yeah. No, yeah, no. The, the reason I ask is because when I said long ball is back in fashion, what I don't mean is the big man, little man, Niall Quinn heads it down to the forward who runs onto the ball. What it yeah. what it really is a sign of is the press is high. Instead of trying to play through the press, which increases the risk of losing the ball high in, in your own uh, in your own half, you play the ball long over the top and you have a fast player who runs onto it. That's sort of what uh, I was referring to, which, I mean, Celtic have plenty of pace up front, James, especially on the wing, um, especially with Maeda. Where does Leila Bada come out into all this? You're also on mute. Amateur hour. Um, <laughs> apologies. So I'll, I'll get to a bot in a second, but I'll segue it from what you and Aaron were just discussing because we've talked about this before relative to uh, John Muller's um, uh, piece that he wrote a couple of years back with Barnsley called Skyball when he was just chronicling the absurdly effective way in which Barnsley was playing that everyone hated, which was that they were lumping, not just going long, but lumping it high. And again, if you just think about this commonsensically, what's one of the harder balls for defenders to control or any footballer to control are high ones, particularly if it's windy or the, you know, the conditions are, are a little uh, sketchy as they typically are in Europe for much of the season. Um, and, and that creates a, a, an element of chaos. And if, if there's an element of chaos you're creating around the opposition's box, a certain amount of that chaos, particularly if you're optimizing for chaos, meaning that you're recruiting players that are very physical, quick, and oh, by the way, you're strategizing with them to do, you know, to, to, to play their style of play, to optimize for chaos, then, you know, the, and I, I use this example of Daryl DK, who's the U.S. Na uh, uh, international striker who hasn't played too much for, for the U.S., but he was at Barnsley during that stretch, and he was... You know, he was like a, an NBA small forward or, or big guard playing striker in the sense of big, physical, quick, not the best guy on the ball, but really ideal for chaos. And, and that's basically what Barnsley did. So I, I think what you're seeing is elements of this uh, starting to get adopted um, by the likes of a Brighton. Um, but it's a delicate thing because it's such a different kind of way of playing. And it flies in the face of some cultural norms. Uh, and that's Are you familiar with Rory Delap? Sorry to interrupt you. Do you know? Not, no, no. Nope. So Rory Delap was an Irish midfielder who played for Stoke City in the mid two thousands, and his powerful, uh, his superpower was long throw-ins, and I mean long throw-ins. He had a rifle, and it got to the point where it was so dangerous that famously there's a clip of a goalkeeper who is being pressed by the defender. And instead of putting it out for a throw, he kicks it out for a corner because that's how dangerous Rory DeLapp's throw-ins were. And that was the organized chaos of Stoke City and what? really effective for them. Ugly, but it, really effective. So that that is that again has become a kind of um, statistical norm at this point, which is that rather than just take a short throw-in, you know, if you're, if you're Livingston playing at Celtic Park, you should be doing a long throw in creating chaos in the Celtic box every single time that you're within striking range, every single free kick that you have, you should be putting everyone up towards the box, kicking it as high as you can in the air and trying to create chaos uh, that could result in a chance that, because if you, if it's again, you just think about this from a common sense perspective, when you've got a disproportion of talent on the pitch, you've got to embrace you know, the advantages that you can get. And a lot of that is just variance and, and chaos creates that. Um, so, you know, th th this, 
<clears throat> also, and I, I've mentioned this before, and again, all these models have strengths and weaknesses, but I think one of the, the strengths that this on bo um, ball value model has from StatsBomb is it quantifies some of these very non-intuitive aspects of this, meaning that if you just think about this commonsensically, if I'm a keeper and I kick the ball long, close to the other team's uh, box, and, it, and I'm optimizing for chaos, right? Is that more likely to create a chance ultimately than if he just, you know, if Joe Hart just rolls the ball three feet to Cameron Carter Vickers, right? So that's what something like, I'm not saying it's better or worse. I'm saying that it does quantify what the relative good and bad is. And then you can develop models relative to the chain of that. Because again, if you're rolling it to Carl Starfelt and his, his, um, his error probability is higher than normal then that's a different prospect of risk and reward versus Joe Hart going long versus passing the ball to Carl Starfelt, right? So there's ways to kind of model what the these decisions are and are you improving your team's chance uh, at scoring? But this is where, again, you get into analytics. Doing a, a over 20,000 games with all of these different personnel, it, that's not really answering the question very well because you're not optimizing that way. It can give you some signal, but well, relative to going from that 58% to 80% to 90%, it's okay. Am I going to commit to this and really build a plan around this edge that we might have? And that's where you get to see the brightness of the world. That's what they're doing. Like whether it's recruiting recruitment, and now it looks like you, you're starting to see it maybe in the way that they're playing um, is more and more saying, okay, let's optimize based off of, some of these inefficiencies that the culture of the game um, still have. And that, that's the, that's the next wave of, like I said, we've seen it in, in the NBA, we've seen it in MLB already where the way that the, the game is actually played has been impacted by these, in, these inefficiencies that teams identify and they change how they're going to play. Again, mm. not everyone's going to like it. Some of it's going to get uglier and, and be worse from a style of play, play perspective, but you know, when you're competing, that's what teams will do sometimes. Data data has done the worst thing possible, and it's proven the likes of Sam Allardyce and the dinosaurs of the world right. You know, in many ways, it's it's pretty funny. I think it's a, a turn that nobody really expected. Uh, now, what I will say Absolutely. is, it's it's fucking ugly, and that's it's not how I, I'd like Celtic to play. But. I think I think the key the key the key and uh, isn't just oh we'll play long ball as James said because we'll play long ball because that's what we'll do. The key is to say we're committing to this player. We're going to recruit specifically for people who've got attributes of anticipation, physical strength, aerial ability, whatever it might be. The ability to kick the ball a long way. I'm, I'm not being flippant. Not everyone can kick the ball a long way, right? But whatever it is, you you're actually recruit specifically for that model rather than it being an ideological decision it's a practical decision and your whole organization has to align behind it that's when it becomes smart not just oh i'm going to kick the ball long because i've got one lad that can launch it into the box it's actually this is a smart way of playing for the resources that we have and the amount of money you've got to spend and the skill set that we've got and that's that or we're all going to get behind it that commitment and that consistency of the operation getting behind it is the smart bit of it providing they then recruit intelligently, which, which is where the analytics comes into it. So it's not just it's not just a sort of fashion thing or a you know a, a philosophical thing. Mm. There's a book which I would recommend people read that is similar enough to this discussion. If you're enjoying this discussion, that is, and if you're not bored by, to tears by it, it's uh, called Winning Ugly by Brad Gilbert, who um, was a former uh, tennis player and um, U.S. tennis player. He, he, yeah, he, he U.S. Coach. tennis player. He, he went on to coach um, Andre Agassi as well, um, and he basically he was somebody who made up his inefficiencies by attacking the weaknesses of other players, and he was really despised for it. People didn't like him within the ten tennis industry because of it, and it's sort of like what Livingston do. You know, they have the small pitch, the the big guys they go at you they're physical they're they're ugly to watch they're defensive but ultimately they are thriving and doing something that they shouldn't really be doing given the talent level and the everything that they have in terms of uh, mo the money gap between them and the rest of the league and facilities and infrastructure but yeah that's uh that's a good book for anybody who's interested in anybody people punching above their weight by doing 
uh, different things. We'll we'll say say that. And um, just before we finish up, then I did mention Lila Bada there because yeah, sorry about you're that. Writing yeah. about him, uh, James. So does Lila Bada have a future at Celtic with all the wingers that they currently have and the potential for a formation change? <laughs> Can, and I'm not. I'm not throwing this. I'm not throwing this. <laughs> I'm not throwing this bomb out here now. Before anybody accuses <laughs> me of clickbait, I'm just asking the question. I'm not saying he doesn't. I'm just asking. Does Lee Labada have a future at Celtic? Is he going to be a starter starter for Celtic next season? Because he did fall out of the team last year. Don't yep. forget that. Even yep. though he was really efficient and scored loads of goals, he did fall out of the team under Ange Postecoglou last year. So. This is me ask for anybody who wants to get involved in the questions or on Twitter or in the YouTube. <laughs> this is me asking the question. This is a question that I'm asking. I'm not actually saying that he doesn't. I'm just asking the question. So don't be a wuss. It, 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 Stop apologizing. A question, is there? Uh, I'm not. A, I'm not clear. A, is that a statement or a question? <laughs> it's, it's just a question. It's a question. So, Do you know the question mark at the end of the sentence? <laughs> that implies that I'm asking a question, not saying uh, something. You, so you're looking for an answer, is what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I hope so, and I think he will. Um, and that's so. Again, going back to this, the, this three-dimensional or four-dimensional um, way of viewing these people as actual human beings and not just these ro robots that um, you know have a job to do for our entertainment um, is, you know, different players respond and have different personality. Um, blends with uh, coaches and, and managers. And I think we've already heard that kind of with, uh, it was made some headlines with certain uh, clickbait people that like to try and, uh, you know, um, get eyeballs, which is Matt O'Reilly's hey, comments. Us? No, well, us too, of course. Yeah. Well, uh, we are clickbait too. merchants, as we all know. We're not good at it, though. That's the point. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we don't even make any money off of it. Um, we're, we're stupid trying to do clickbait. <laughs> Um, for no reason. So, um, you know, the comments from Matt O'Reilly is, you know, R Rogers, by all accounts, is a very different stylistic manager um, with maybe a different form of emotional intelligence. Um, and there are going to be players that respond differently to that style of manager than the style that Ange is reportedly to be. And is um, Abada that type of player? I don't know. I mean, I have no clue. Would it, would it be within the realm of reasonable possibilities? I think so. Um, particularly when you've got Rodgers and his reputation for de developing young players, developing young wingers. Um, and it's not as if he's dealing with a player that do hasn't shown significant raw materials uh, to develop. And I, I think that's the other part of this. Um, and the, the other part of that could be, so if you look at kind of a holistic um, profile of a Bada, the, the the area of play that he probably struggled with the most during Ange's tenure is defending and pressing. Um, and I'm not saying he was bad at it necessarily. I'm just saying that like relative to who else he was playing, you're trying to get playing time with or uh, versus, um, you know, no one's like Maeda, obviously. Um, and then you're like, oh, okay, is he going to beat Al Jota? And it's like for a starting spot. So if Maeda is the lockdown starter for whatever reason, good or bad, that was seemed to be the decision. Um, and we talked about that last season that at points, I think Alan would probably agree with me that we disagreed with that, at, <laughs> particularly in certain matchups. Um, so I, I, I think that's kind of a clean slate. Jota's gone. To me, he's a lockdown starter. I mean, I, I and, he, and if he can continue to improve because there's been evidence of while he, he maybe is less than ideal with his profile defending and pressing, he's been improving and he's still 21. So, you know, and he's a, he's a physically gifted individual. It's not like he's, you know, slow or got a, you know, he's off a, a, a step relative to his position. He's got quickness and pace. So with more development and coaching, and if he's got a good relationship theoretically with Rogers, where maybe he didn't as much with Ange, I, to me, it sounds like a great, um, a great appeal. And we've talked about this many times. He's an idiosyncratic player. He's pretty bad on the ball trying to beat a fullback 1v1 in dribbling, right? That's like his one of his glaring, obvious issues. Um, and that creates this like mental accounting thing where people, I think, unfairly um, rate him lower than he probably is because of how good he is in some of these other aspects of play. 
that are incredibly important, taking chances, getting in spaces for chances. And, and um, you, you know, that that's where the, the, the data is clear, like his ability to get on the end of quality chances uh, and to create quality chances for teammates is actually kind of unrivaled. Um, I mean, it, it even dwarfed in totality um, Jota in that regard. Um, so to me, it's, you know, the now if someone came in from Saudi Arabia and offered 30 million for him, would that change the, <laughs> the conversation? But the numbers that were being bantied about of like 10 million or maybe, you know, in that area to me for his age and what he's doing, I think that would be nuts. And um, particularly given if he if he buys in and I, I think that's, you know, the rumbling sounded like maybe a player that didn't see himself at the club because maybe of a relationship issue with the manager. I could see that. And that changed. And now maybe his decision changed. And I say that's great news. Yeah, well, I mean. As much as I talk about, we talk about transfers and trying to get players in and out. I do like a player who wants to stick around and actually, you know, improve himself before he moves on. Because eventually, these players will move on. So they will accept a bid for Lilibata. But the fact that he didn't have a great season last year in terms of game time, and instead of throwing the prams, out, the to- toys out of the pram. And just leaving the club as soon as he gets an offer from anybody else, Alan, it's a situation where he actually says, no, I want to get back into the team here. There's a good manager here. I have Champions League football. This is where I want to be for at least another season. That shows to me that he's a mature player for his age, which is also a very positive thing, which you don't normally get with somebody who uh, is the age that uh, Abada is. Yeah, and listen, we don't we don't know sometimes, you know, you think it's the player that's unsettled, but maybe it's the player agent that's unsettling the player. That can often be the case. Um, also, we don't know what impact it had when Nier Bitton uh, left the club in terms of sort of mentoring Abada. Uh, and then, of course, as you say, he was in and out of the team last season, but a bit like O'Reilly, he pretty much played in every game that he was available to some extent. So he was a, he was a much trusted squad player in, 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 as a minimum. I, I look when I looked at Abada last year, I was astonished. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it isn't even the quality of the data. I, I've got a lot of data, and actually, the best thing you can do is think of the right question, uh, because you're thinking of the right question is the hardest part. That's the analytics bit. It's not not and the data crunching is a kind of mechanical, boring, long process. But thinking of the right question, but even a simple question was like, has about about improved? Um, I was astonished at the answer to that because even though he was in and out of the team as a starter, mainly as a sub, um, his attacking metrics had kind of increased across the board. Now, again, context. Some of that was what I talked about last season about the sort of substitute dividend of he wasn't starting the game. He was coming on late. He was playing against in many cases, most cases actually, defeated opposition. So there was some stat boosting going on there. But even allowing for all that, uh, you know, he had shown demonstrable improvement in a lot of his data, which covered the circumstances of him, you know, not starting many games and not playing 90 minutes for many games. I thought it was incredible. And to me, I've always, always, he's somebody that owns the, the, uh, the boundaries of your, of your data in terms of if you look at just his raw expected goals plus expected assists, which is what expected scoring contribution, it's always been over one. <laughs> So that, what that means is you would expect him to either score or, or assist at least once every game. And it's an incredibly hard thing to maintain. And for a 19-year-old to maintain that over two seasons, I would suggest puts him in the top five of under-21 players in Europe. Um, so I, I honestly thought, given that whether it was him or he didn't actually for a move, I honestly thought he'd not end up at Brighton. I thought he'd be a classic Brighton player. They'd steal him for about 10 million. And he, he would do a, he would do a great job. They'd flip him for a lot of money eventually. It's absolutely fantastic news that it looks like he's staying. Um, exactly to James's point, we've got very different. Although, although I don't think the style of football is going to be a million miles apart from last season, I think we've got a very different individual in charge now. And uh, the way I'd characterise it is that Postacoglu, you could see him as almost being a, a figurehead for the football club. He would he would actually take the football club on his shoulders. And he would probably have some interest in what everybody was doing. I think he wanted to let people get on with it. But I think with Rodgers, you've got an elite coach, right? You've got somebody who want all he wants to really do is be on the training ground with the players. And he wants to know about those players. He wants to form relationships with them. He wants to understand their motivations. He 
and to improve them individually if they're, if they're so inclined. Whereas Postacoglu, it was a case of this is the way we're going to do it. Are you going to it? This is the system. Who's going to come along this journey with me? And if you're in, you're in. If you're out, you're out. And there was no grey area around that at all. I think with, with Raj, it's much more. He doesn't, I don't think he really cares what a lot of the departments and the football operations will do. He just expects them to do their job and support his 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 first team, really. And but what he really wants to be at the end of the day is he wants to be on the training ground with the players. Very different approach. And I've got great. I'm I'm actually more excited about two things really under Rogers. One is to the extent to which he'll improve the players that we've already got. And I'm and I think the ones who've got the physical attributes, hopefully the mental attributes, uh, and are young enough to still have a lot of growth. Are you know? I'm, I'm going to say Bernabe. I, I might be. I might be miles out here. I might be clinging to absolute false hope in this one. But I've just still got this little bit of my fingernail still clinging on to hope that we'll make something of Bernabe. But certainly, you know, Hatati, certainly O'Reilly, and absolutely certainly Abada. I think are all players that I'm expecting to see great things and great improvements from under under the current manager. And the second thing that I'm super excited about is to say how we'll adapt the way we play to different circumstances and, and what that means. And can we, because I don't think, I'll, I'll be honest with you, right? So I don't think we we're any further forward as far as being a Champions League level competitive side. In fact, I think we're weaker because Jota was the one player who stepped up uh, and his performances dipped the least when put under pressure of Champions League performances. And the other one was Aaron Moy and we've lost both of them. Okay, I think they were the two players that were capable of bridging the gap to the greater extent to the Champions League level. Um, and we've lost them both, and, and I don't think we're any stronger. So the way that Rodgers is, because we're only a few, you know, um, less than less than two months out from starting a Champions League campaign, is it's going to be through team organisation. Uh, he's going to come up with uh, tricks and ploys, set up these players to mitigate the gap in quality that we're going to face. And I'm just really excited about how he's going to do that. I'm really Really looking forward to seeing how he solves that problem. Well, and I'm, I'm still reserving the expectation that you know the the bantied about thirty million that even if that's the number that was going to be used as the budget for you know kind of improving the squad with eyes towards the Ange project in Europe, and if that's the number that's even above and beyond, you know, like ignoring the the Jota money, um, we've not spent anywhere near that. <laughs> Uh, so again, with the transition to Rogers, I, I'd be shocked. If, I mean, maybe it's not the 15 million or something, you know, anything huge. But even if you get a keeper like the guy from uh, Dynamo, uh, if that level of player and a couple of more Jota CCV levels come in, I mean, that's a game changer. Those those are of level of players that completely recalibrate, um, and that's what I'm counting on. Because if not, like if this is the game plan. Um, that's going to be disappointing because to Alan's point, I, I don't think we've made material talent upgrades to the point where we can say, you know, outside of the, ta the tactical part of it, that you could reasonably expect, you know, ultimately it's going to come down to the draw, but <laughs> that we're going to have a, a puncher's chance of, of getting second, let alone third in, in a Champions League group. I was just about to say that we got out of the podcast in a way that would allow me to say that I told you that it's not all do doom and gloom on this podcast. It's it's not so doom and gloom. So we still got 20 million to spend, Enda. That's the point. That's the that's the positive. There, there's probably 20 million in transfer fees of talent that might still be coming in the door. And it makes mm. sense that it's not in yet. Those kind of deals take longer. We had the managerial turnover. I I, I suspect that we'll still see some big some big ones coming in. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I wasn't, and I wasn't suggesting either, either that that isn't going to happen. Uh, yeah, no, I believe I... there are still still things going on in the background in, in that regard. But um, you know, it's going to come down to a combination of. I think we do need. You, you cannot, as I said before, it's not. I don't, and I'm not saying you have to spend X, Y, or Z amount. It's just by whatever means that is available, and hopefully as cheap as possible. And then you've got to, we've got to raise the quality of the players that we have. It's as simple as that. We cannot compete without better quality players. It really, there's no data is going to change that. Unfortunately. So, you know, and, and as James rightly says, these things do take longer and actually are far more difficult. The higher quality player that you go for, 
the less likely they're going to want to come to Scotland, <laughs> the less likely you are going to be able five years' worth of those wages, because that's the, going to be the key thing, not the transfer money. Celtic's a cash-rich club, and, and, and in world terms, probably one of the most cash-rich clubs in the world outside those that are not state-owned. Um, but 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 you've got to pay the wages, and you've got to pay the wages for five years. So that's the piece, right? And 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 that's that's the bit that needs sustainable growth, which means building revenue year on year through player trading. And that's why these one to two million to three million that we're bringing in the door, I'm absolutely fine with that. But what we need to be doing is flipping those players quicker and more of them, so as that one million becomes three million or four million, and and then you do three, you do that three or four times every summer, and suddenly. You've grown your revenue by 12, 15 million. You do that every summer and suddenly you can start paying more wages. You can attract better players. That's where we need to get to. And I still think we're on the first step when we're taking baby steps in that direction. I'm not criticizing the club. I think we're going in the right direction and it's going to take time and I'm going to have to be patient and everyone else is going to have to be patient. But I'm just trying to put into context. Mm -hmm. That's where we will park the podcast for this week. We will be building up to the season ahead. Probably next week we will be doing our season preview because the 5th of August is the the starting uh, starting point for Celtic in the league this season. So we are very, very close to that. And hopefully it will be an exciting season ahead. Some homework for everybody who wants to do some homework after this game uh, or after this podcast, rather. Uh, James's piece on Leila Bada is on the Celtic way. Alan's piece on long balls is also on the Celtic way. The TIFO IRL video is um, very good. If you want to go look at that, they go into why transfers sometimes don't work out. And Winning Ugly by Brad Gilbert is the book that I mentioned. Uh, if you want to check that out as well, uh, you can go and get them. If you want to get everything to do with the Huddle Breakdown, you can follow us on Twitter at Huddle Breakdown or subscribe on YouTube is the best thing to do. Leave a comment, like the video, and subscribe if you're not subscribed. We shall chat to you next week. Until then, good luck.